When the Buddha told people to go meditate, he didn't say, go do samatha, or tranquility, or go do vipassana, insight. He said, go do jhana. And he used a verb, jayati, which is also the verb for burning with a steady flame. You probably know the image of the flames of passion, aversion, and delusion. That uses a different verb. Those are the flames that leap up, the flames you can't read by because they're so erratic. Where jayati is the verb they use for an oil lamp, the flame of an oil lamp, burning steadily, steadily enough so you can read by it and see things clearly. So basically what you're doing as you, as you meditate is to adjust the flames of your mind so that they're steady. Now in the canon when the Buddha talks about jhana, he describes the different levels you can get into. And at first glance it seems like he's not telling you what to do. But actually his instructions for how you get into jhana are in his instructions for right mindfulness. The establishing of mindfulness is how you get the mind into right concentration. It involves two things. On the one hand, you keep track of one object, and on the other hand, you let go of all your concerns about the world. This is why his meditation instructions are not just about how to get focused, say, on the breath, but also how to think about your distractions so that you don't get entangled with them. There's a sutta where Rahula, the Buddha's son, comes to ask him how to do breath meditation. And the Buddha doesn't start right in with his instructions on breath meditation. He talks about different things to examine, it's different things to contemplate. And his first instruction is try to make your mind like earth. People throw disgusting things on the earth, but the earth doesn't react. Make your mind like wind. Wind blows trash around, but it's not disgusted by the trash. Make your mind like water. Water is used to wash dirty things away, but the water is not disgusted by the dirt. Make your mind like fire. Fire burns trash, but it's not disgusted by the trash. In other words, have an attitude that you want to be non-reactive. Not that being non-reactive is the goal. It's what enables you to see what's going on in your mind. If you react to the slightest little thing then you're not going to be able to see what happens next after that slightest little thing and what happens next. And what you see is going to be colored by your likes and your dislikes. You've got to get your, them out of the way as much as you can. The Buddha also gives recommendations for how to develop the Brahma Viharas, like we chanted just now, attitudes of goodwill, compassion, empathetic joy equanimity. Because all too often when you're sitting and meditating, the face of somebody you know may appear. Somebody you like, somebody you don't like, somebody from your past, somebody you don't rec recognize at all. And your first reaction to all, should always be goodwill for that person, to cut through any of the narratives that might come in and entangle the mind. But it also gave the contemplation of the unattractiveness of the body. If you start getting overcome with attachment to your body or lust for somebody else's body, you have to stop and think, what are bodies made of? We had the list just now, 32 parts that they list, and there are actually more than are in the list. I always thought of eyes as being a particularly weird thing in your body. The only reason we can look at eyes is because we have eyelids. Otherwise, we'd be freaked out by everybody else's eyeballs. And some people complain that this is teaching you a negative body image, and there are so many of us in this society who are being taught a negative body image. But that's an unhealthy negative body image. They're teaching you that your body is ugly and everybody else's is beautiful, or certain people's bodies are beautiful. But this contemplation reminds you everybody's bodies are made up of the same things. It's a great equalizer. 
And so he asks himself, what is there of any real value there? There are things that you can use, but in and of themselves there's nothing particularly attractive about them, particularly worthy of grasping hold of. People often think this is a contemplation just for monks and nuns, but it's for everybody, because when you die you're going to have to let go of the body. And there are a lot of people who can't. They just hover around their bodies afterwards. And it's a miserable state to be in. So you get used to thinking of your body as something that you use. It's a tool that you want to use to a good purpose. And then when the time comes, you'll have to put it aside. It helps cut through a lot of unskillful thinking and a lot of unskillful emotions around the body. The Buddha also recommends that as a tool to cut aside all your entanglement with the world. Contemplation of inconstancy, that things are, out in the world are totally inconstant, changing all the time, and that they're not self. There's nothing out there you can really lay claim to. There are things that are yours for a, a while, for the time being, but all too often you get pushed out of them. And as the Buddha saw in his reflection on the world before he left home, everything is laid claim to, and sometimes there are lots of overlapping claims. And if you're going to go out and try to stake your claim for happiness in the world outside, we've got to fight somebody else off. So these are reflections for cutting through the distractions that come up as you're trying to get the mind to stay with the breath, or whatever topic you've chosen for your concentration. Because getting the mind concentration requires, as I said, these two activities. One is keeping track of one perception, keeping track of one sensation, or the breath, one activity of the body. And at the same time, as the text says, putting aside greed and distress with reference to the world. In other words, all your emotions around the world, concerning the world. You want to be able to put them aside, at least for the time being. You want to give the mind some space just to be with one object. One of the qualities of concentration is called chetas egakata, which means singleness of mind. Sometimes it's translated as one-pointedness, but the word aga in that compound does not necessarily mean point. It can also mean gathering place. And one gathering place for the mind. You gather it around one object. And then you take that one object and you try to let it fill your awareness. Like with the breath. But the breath is something that is present throughout the body, which is one of the reasons why it's number one topic of concentration. We've got the in and out breath, but also got the breath energies moving in the the nerves, the breath energy is moving down the muscles and through the blood vessels. Every part of the body that you can sense, it's because there is breath in that part of the body. So you focus on the areas where the breath energy is clearest, and you're trying to maintain that steady flame of a focal point. And then as things begin to settle down and there's a sense of well-being, then you let that sense of ease spread throughout the body. The Buddha's image is of a bathman or a bathman's apprentice who, back in those days, they didn't have soap. The bathman's apprentice had to take a kind of soap powder and mix it with water and make a dough-like lump that you would then rub over your body. And just as when you're making bread, you mix the water with the flour. There's not water dripping out, and there's no flour that hasn't been moistened. Everything is mixed together just right. In the same way you try to let that pleasure saturate your body. And then you try to maintain that. The purpose of all this is so that you get to see the mind clearly. We're doing this not so much for the breath or for the pleasure, but for the fact that the breath and the pleasure working together like this. 
yeah, everything coextensive. There's a sense of your full awareness of the body, the sense of pleasure full of the body. It's all coextensive. It's a good place for the mind to rest, gain strength, and also see itself clearly. That steady flame allows you to see clearly when something comes up, a thought that's not related to the breath. You can see it come, and if you're not going to get involved with it, you just see it go. Or if you want, you can zap it. In other words, you sense that when a thought comes up, there's a little stirring, a tightening, or a little knot of something appearing in some part of the body. And before you're really clearly aware whether it's a thought or a physical sensation, it'll be right there on the sort of the edge between what's physical and what's mental in your awareness. And you notice that the mind will then slap a perception on either saying that it is a physical thing and that's all, or it will say that it's something mental, it's a, a thought, and then you look into it. What is this thought about? And there's always that question, is it really about anything until you make it be about something? Because all too often we approach everything in our life with certain ideas in mind. And this is the main message of the Buddha's analysis of suffering. He says that what we sense through the six senses is our old karma. But even before we have that, there's a whole string of conditions in terms of how we breathe, how we're talking to ourselves, what intentions we have, what we're paying attention to. And these come prior for your experience of the senses in the present moment. And so in the same way with a thought, it's not necessarily a particular thought that comes bubbling up, but there's an excuse for turning something into a thought appearing. You slap a few perceptions on it, you stitch a few fabrications on it, and then you go. And those contemplations the Buddha gave you are to remind you, no, I want to, don't want to do this. I want to step back from these things. So if you find yourself entangled with something, pull out one of those contemplations. Just one, remind yourself you want the mind to be like earth. And then if you find yourself getting entangled in thoughts of anger, okay, use that contemplation of goodwill. Thoughts of lust, use the contemplation of the body. Anything else, you don't know specifically what it is, but it's got you entangled. You'll think about the fact that this thing that I'm entangled is not going to last that long. It's not really under my control. Why do I want to go there? Then you try to get back to the breath. And you find that as you get quicker and quicker at recognizing this process by which a thought forms, you can catch it at earlier stages and disband it. That's why I mean by zapping it. As the energies get tangled to that spot, you can comb out the tangle, vaporize the tangle, like a spider on a web. The spider sits in one corner, then senses something vibrating in the web, goes to that spot, takes care of whatever has been caught at the web, and then goes back to its corner. This way you, you use the breath to soothe and connect everything throughout the body. And then you have your one spot so that when everything is connected, you know when a thought is about to develop. And these spots in the body where these little tangles of tension can appear can, can be anywhere in the body. Sometimes a thought will be related to, say, a tangle of tension in an arm or in the side of your head or who knows where, which is why your attention has to be all around. Another reason why you have to develop a state that's centered but broad. There's a steady flame, but it's, the flame fills the entire body. Then you protect it. So in this way, when you're doing jhana, you're, you're developing tranquility and you're gaining insight at the same time. As the Buddha said, to get the mind into jhana, you have to use both tranquility and insight. And once the mind is in jhana, then it can develop your tranquility and insight. All these qualities go together. In fact, 
for him, Vipassana was not a name of a meditation technique. It was a name of a quality of the mind, a clear seeing quality. Samatha was also a quality of the mind, calm, tranquility. Jhana is the activity. This is what we're trying to do as we meditate. This is the skill we're trying to develop. And it's perfectly fine to think about this as a goal that you do something with. The qualities that the Buddha said go into getting the mind into concentration include desire, effort, intentness, using your powers of judgment. And it's somewhat ironic that in a lot of modern meditation instructions, Desire, effort, and judgment are considered to be bad things. And even with intent, they just say, well, just be intent on whatever. That's mindfulness. But that's not mindfulness. Mindfulness is keeping something in mind, like keeping the breath in mind. And learning how to use these other qualities in a mature way, that's how the meditation actually becomes successful. It is something you can succeed at. You focus your desire on the causes. You're trying to fine-tune your effort so that it's just right. And you learn how to be judicious and figure out if the mind is getting entangled in something, how do you untangle it? If the focus of the mind is too strong or too weak, how do you adjust that? So that the flame is just right. It doesn't leap around. It's steady. And you can really see things clearly in the mind. You can see things clearly through the whole range of your body. And John Lee has a nice image. He says it's like the mantle of a Coleman lantern. If you've ever seen one of those, they, there's just a little bit of kerosene comes out. It's got this little sack of cloth, very coarsely woven. And the kerosene comes out and it flickers around that cloth. So the whole mantle glows. So try to think of your body as that little sack of cloth. And the breath runs around all of this, all the breath channels. And it just glows. And there's nothing else you have to do at that point. Getting the mind to be still requires some insight, some tranquility. Maintaining it means that you're satisfied to stay right there. And if the question comes up, what's next? This is what's next. And where are the insights going to come? They're going to come here. But regardless, <coughs> excuse me, regard this as a skill that you really want to master. Because it has so many uses and it's so central to the path. Without it, the path is just a lot of ideas. With it, the other, the other aspects of the path suddenly become very illuminated. Because you're seeing them with that steady flame, that all-around flame. to learn how to adjust these things carefully, getting your mind adjusted. is a really worthwhile skill to master. <laughs>